All right, Karen, it's all yours. Okay, thanks a lot. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Karen Isaac Levo, and I'm a neuropsychologist with the Northeast Regional Epilepsy Group. And today I'm going to be speaking about neuropsychological assessment in epilepsy. And the point of the presentation is really to explain a little bit about what the testing is, what does it mean when your doctor refers you for a neuropsychological evaluation, and hopefully take some, some of the mystery and possibly fear and anxiety out of the neuropsychological evaluation by letting you know what to expect and what the testing is all about. So this is a quote from a long time ago, from 1881, and um, I'll read it out loud. The mental state of epileptics, as is well known, frequently presents deterioration, and this constitutes one of the consequences of the disease, which is much dreaded and is often most serious. In the slighter form, there is merely defective memory, especially for recent acquisitions in more severe degree. There is greater impairment of mental power, weakened capacity for attention, and often defective moral control. So William Gowers was a neurologist from the 19th century, and, and although some of the assertions in this statement are, are certainly not very sensitive and, and, and not necessarily true, um, what I wish to convey is that there was an understanding even back then that seizures could affect memory and cognitive functions, and fortunately, as epilepsy has become better understood over the past hundred or more years, the prior stigma associated with the disorder has been reduced dramatically. So particularly with regard to that final statement, that's certainly no longer the case. But there is this idea that epilepsy can affect your, your thinking, your cognitive function. And that is the reason why um, neuropsychological evaluation is so important um, for patients with epilepsy. So just to give you a very broad definition of neuropsychology, it's the discipline that focuses on the relationship between brain and behavior. So our brains are responsible for our behavior. And this is the idea of how your brain affects your behavior. And what neuropsychologists do is they describe and quantify the cognitive and behavioral manifestations of brain dysfunction, and we use standardized measures. So quantify, um, when we say when I say quantify, it's all of our tests are normed. So we want to see how patients are doing compared to other people that are of their similar age, education, um, sometimes even ethnicity is taken into account. Describe, the numbers tell us something, but not the whole story. So we want to observe the quality of a patient's responses. How did the patient arrive at that answer? What about his or her approach led to an impaired score or maybe a superior score? What strategies did they use? And this is often the richer information and the more meaningful information that we glean when we do these evaluations. So there's the objective part of it, but there's also the subjective, so the, the, the quantifying um, and understanding the quality um, of patients' responses. So when a patient is referred for a neuropsychological evaluation, the idea is to look at your brain by using these tests. So just as maybe you've had an EEG or an MRI of the brain to look at your brain, these tests help us look at your brain essentially by making you use it. Um, so the, pa the tests are all paper and pencil, answering questions kinds of tests. There's nothing painful, no needles, nothing like that. Um, and the tests are um, developed to be to test the limits of what you know and what you're able to do. So some of them you might find to be a little bit easier. Some of them you might find to be a little bit more difficult. So the purpose is there are many, many reasons why someone might be evaluated for neuropsychological testing. So in a surgical patient, someone that is being considered for epilepsy surgery, the test can help us identify areas of cognitive deficit that could be associated with the seizure focus. Um, neuropsychological tests aren't quite as good as localizing as they are at lateralizing. And what I mean by that is that for many tests, there are so many cognitive functions that are tapped by a single test. 
to make a correlation or a one-to-one -one correlation between a certain test and a specific area of the brain. But the test can give us an idea of when I say lateralized dysfunction, is that certain um, cognitive functions are associated with the right hemisphere of the brain or typically associated with the left hemisphere of the brain. And that we can get some answers sometimes if we're comparing verbal versus nonverbal types of skills. I'll get into that a little bit more as we go on. Um, another purpose of neuropsychological testing in the surgical patient is to get a baseline level of functioning. So this way we'll know how a patient is functioning before the surgery, and we can use it as a comparison for post-operative test results to see if there were any changes um, and to determine whether there's a need for anything like a cognitive rehabilitation following surgery. Also gives us an outline of a, patient, a patient's strengths and weaknesses. So as you're doing the test, you'll find that some of them are a little bit easier and some of them are a little bit harder, and everybody has their own pattern of strengths and weaknesses. Maybe you consider yourself to be a very verbal person, um, whereas visuospatial kinds of things maybe are more difficult for you. So it gives us an idea, an objective look at someone's cognitive strengths and weaknesses. It also helps us predict post-operative memory function. So depending on how someone does on these tests before surgery, in terms of their memory, whether it be verbal memory or visual memory, we can make a prediction as to how they might do following the surgery. And um, this is, again, predicting the outcome from surgery. What We don't always know exactly what will happen, but it can give us some sense. Now, neuropsychological testing is often um, also non-surgical patients. Non-surgical epilepsy patients are often um, also referred for neuropsychological testing, and there are other reasons for doing that. Again, characterizing possible cognitive deficits associated with seizures. Um, we know that patients with epilepsy are particularly vulnerable to developing memory problems um, and problems with certain uh, frontal lobe um, uh, frontal lobe deficits, so things like um, planning, organization, uh, executive function. Um, another purpose in the non-surgical patient is assessment of medication effects. So if, if you have been recently prescribed a medication and you feel like maybe it's having some impact on your cognitive functioning. Maybe you're feeling a little bit slowed down, or maybe you feel like you're having some word-finding problems. The neuropsychological evaluation can give us an objective measure of the effects. Educational and occupational guidance. So once we know what are the areas of strength and what are the areas of weakness, then we can make some recommendations as to what might be helpful, either in an educational setting or in terms of someone's occupation or vocation. The test results can also give us in, um, an idea of how to intervene when there are cognitive problems. So we can make recommendations based on the findings um, as to certain compensatory strategies that might be helpful to people either at work or in school or just in their daily lives. Um, part of a neuropsychological evaluation is also to assess psychological function. So we look at we look for symptoms of depression and anxiety and anger, um, various psychiatric problems, and so when those come up, we also can intervene based on the findings and point someone in the correct direction in terms of whether they need perhaps psychotherapy or medication for treatment of psychiatric problems. And finally, in a non-surgical patient, it also gives us a functional assessment. So maybe in an older adult, is the patient able to manage independently? Will they need um, support or, or care or an aid in the house? And also um, help determine eligibility for state and federal services. This is these kinds of evaluations, neuropsychological evaluations, are often asked for um, when someone is applying for something like disability. So as a neuropsychologist, there are a lot of factors that we consider when preparing for the evaluation. So the first factor that we consider is age. And this is important because we know that certain cognitive functions tend to change as we age. So memory 
everyone's memory tends to um, decline to some degree, to a mild degree, even as early as their, their mid-30s or 40s. So when we're looking at these tests, you are compared to other people of your similar age and education because if you're 80 years old, we don't expect your memory to be like that of a 40-year-old. So we have to take age into, effect, into account. Um, other factors to consider include gender, education. Um, certainly, um, someone with a higher education is going to, their norms are going to be different than someone with a lower level of education. And then other aspects that we consider are sometimes only considered qualitatively. So someone's socioeconomic status, um, their linguistic background. If English is not the first language, then that's something that we have to take into account when we're doing these tests. We try as much as possible to test someone in their first language, but if that's not possible, then we have to kind of keep in the back of our mind that if English is a second language, then certain tests are certainly going to be more challenging. Um, cultural background also needs to be taken into account. Um, if these tests that we're using are normed on an English-speaking United States population. So if someone grew up in a very different culture, um, some of these tests aren't going to necessarily make as much sense to them, and they might struggle with them because having not been educated in the United States. Um, other factors that to consider include a history of a learning disability or attention deficit disorder, patient's medical history, their psychiatric history. Um, we also want to know whether they've previously had neuropsychological testing because that's important in terms of their familiarity with the test, but also so that we can make a comparison and know that we have those records available to see whether there have been any changes over time. Now, the, the things that I just mentioned are important considerations for testing any population, we also have specific considerations in evaluation of patients with epilepsy. So in selecting our test, we use what's called a flexible hypothesis-driven approach. So I might have a standardized battery that I give to everyone, but if I know that someone is coming in reporting a specific cognitive difficulty, or if I know that they have a certain type of epilepsy, then I might add certain tests based on um, this, this hypothesis-driven approach, so based on the idea that I might expect there to be certain areas of weakness based on where their seizures are coming from. We certainly emphasize memory evaluation in patients with epilepsy because, as I mentioned, that's one of the areas that's most vulnerable and that's one of the areas that patients tend to report having the most difficulty with. Um, we also um, assess functions associated with frontal brain regions, which as I mentioned before, kind of higher order cognitive functions, things like planning and organization and abstract reasoning. Um, we also want to look at right versus left hemisphere um, functioning. So we know that in most right-handed or the, the nearly 100% of right-handed individuals, the left hemisphere of their brain is thought to support language and verbal kinds of functions, whereas the right side of the brain, whereas it's less well understood, it tends to be more nonverbal or visual-spatial. So if we're comparing something like verbal versus visual memory or verbal versus nonverbal intellectual functioning, we're looking at lateralized dysfunction, so comparing the two hemispheres of the brain. And the other consideration in, in um, evaluation of patients with epilepsy is psychological or psychosocial functioning because we know that there's a lot of comorbidity with things like depression or anxiety and those things can also have an effect on cognitive functioning. So we want to see whether there are any um, symptoms in those areas that could possibly be contributing to the neuropsychological profile. So when you come in, for the neuropsychological evaluation, there are several components. The first thing that I do is a clinical interview to find out a little bit about what brings the patient here, um, their, their history. I'll go into that in a little bit more detail in just a moment. So the first thing is just the interview. 
The next part is the evaluation of cognitive functions, and those are all the various neuropsychological tests that we use. And finally, there's psychological emotional assessment, which is mostly in the form of self-report inventory. So questionnaires where there's no right or wrong answer, and patients are just asked to give their impression or their, their responses based on their own understanding of themselves. So the first part, as I mentioned, is the clinical interview. And during the clinical interview, there are certain, there, there's information that I want to get, including a review of seizure history, um, how frequently the seizures occur, how the seizures are characterized, when did seizures begin. Um, I also like to get a patient's subjective report of their cognitive problems. So I want to know whether a patient is reporting problems with memory, problems with word finding, problems with attention. Um, I'm looking for also emotional status, so how patient is reporting their mood to be, and whether they have any history of psychiatric illness. I also want a general medical history, as well as what medications they're taking. Um, family history, so whether there's any family history of epilepsy or any other um, significant medical condition. The other important information that we want to get is information regarding developmental history and birth history, as well as educational history. So if you've ever been diagnosed with a learning disability or ever got any special help or remedial attention in school. Um, occupational history whether the patient is working, what are they doing, and how long have they been doing it for, and whether they're having any difficulties in work, at work, um, associated with maybe problems with memory or attention. And finally, a psychosocial history, which is things like um, marital status, um, if you have any children, um, also just what a typical day like is for you, the patient. So that covers the clinical interview. Then the bulk of the evaluation is the assessment of cognitive functions. And we look at all different aspects of your thinking. Your brain does so many different things. And we want to get a comprehensive picture of cognitive function. So we look at current level of intellectual functioning, um, an estimate of pre-morbid intellectual functioning, which sounds kind of terrible, but what it really means is how, based on your age, based on your level of education, based on your reading level, where would we expect your level of intellectual functioning to be? And then we compare the actual scores to the estimated scores to see whether there's been any sort of decline from a previously higher level of functioning. We assess attention and executive function, language, visual-spatial abilities, Memory, which is broken down into verbal memory and visual or nonverbal memory. We assess motor functions like fine motor speed, coordination, and um, a brief assessment um, of academic skills, things like reading, spelling, math. So the first part is the assessment of intellectual functioning. And that's typically done with a scale called the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale. And we're now in the fourth edition. And this scale provides a full scale IQ and four indices which measure various areas of intellectual functioning. So we have verbal intellectual functioning, nonverbal intellectual functioning, working memory and attention, and visual processing speed. And as I mentioned before, then we want to see whether the actual scores, how they compare to where we think someone should be performing. So we use something called the test of premorbid functioning, which provides information on what a patient's level of intellectual functioning should be, taking into consideration demographic and performance-based indices. And what it basically is, it's a list of words that increase in difficulty and your estimated score is based on your age, based on your level of education, and also based on your ability to read these words. Because reading is considered what's called a crystallized skill. And it's something that we don't expect to change much as we get older, unlike other skills that we might have. And 
on the basis of this score, we can determine whether there has been a global decline from a previously higher level of functioning or maybe just a, a decline in a certain area, like processing speed or attention. So another part, um, another aspect of cognitive functioning that we assess is attention. And we look at different aspects of attention. There's simple auditory attention, which would be something like I read um, numbers, and you repeat back those numbers. And it gets incre increasingly difficult because I give you longer and longer strings of numbers to repeat. Working memory is sort of like attention plus. So that's if I gave you numbers and asked you to tell me the numbers backwards. So there, you have to attend to the information, but then mentally manipulate that information in order to give it to me backward. Then we have sustained attention. So in someone, for instance, with um, ADHD, their sustained attention may be impaired. So their ability to maintain their focus over a prolonged period of time. And then another part of this is processing speed. So how quickly you can perform maybe a relatively simple task like sequencing numbers, sort of like a dot to dot. But what we want to see there is how quickly you're able to perform that task. How is your processing speed or your psychomotor speed? So executive functions, if you want to think of them as your brain CEO, that's the area that's responsible for higher order cognitive functions, things, as I said, like planning and organization and abstract reasoning. And we do a lot of different tests that look at these various functions. And what we're really looking for throughout the entire evaluation is a pattern of performance. So if there's an isolated area where you have um, a mild deficit here or there, we're not going to make too much of that. It's really that we're looking for a pattern of dysfunction in a certain area that can give us some idea of how your brain is functioning and maybe um, also give some idea of how that correlates with the seizures or the seizure focus. We also assess various aspects of language. So things like your vocabulary, your that would be your expression, your comprehension, how well you understand um, language, repetition, your ability to repeat phrases of greater length and difficulty, verbal fluency. That would be if I gave you a letter of the alphabet or a category and asked you to tell me as many words as you could think of beginning with that letter or belonging to that category over a certain period of time. That's your verbal fluency. And then naming. So oftentimes people, patients will say that they have difficulty with word retrieval. And so if, if we do a test where we show different pictures of various objects, and you have to name the object in the picture, and that gives us an idea of someone's naming or word retrieval abilities. So just as we assess language functions, we also assess visual spatial functions. And these might be tests of visual construction, like putting together designs with blocks or copying a pattern of a, a complex figure, or visual perceptual abilities where you're not necessarily drawing anything or putting anything together, but maybe judging spatial orientation or the angles of lines. So anything that has to do with your visual spatial functions. And it's not terribly unusual to see that someone has a strength or a weakness in verbal versus um, visual spatial functions, or at least a discrepancy. Um, in one in between the two areas. So a main focus of a neuropsychological evaluation is, again, memory. And we look at both verbal memory and visual memory. With verbal memory, we might assess that by giving a list of words to remember, or reading a story and having a patient repeat the story, and then recall that information, either the list information or the story information, later on to see if you're able to retain that information. Visual spatial memory would be something like remembering pictures, either complex or more simple designs, um, or remembering visual contextual information like looking at a whole picture scene and having to remember what was going on in that scene. So it could be more abstract or it could be more um, contextual, like a picture. And again, sometimes 
particularly in a pre-surgical patient, we want to compare verbal memory versus visuospatial memory because it can give us some idea of right versus left hemisphere functioning. We also look at motor functions because we want to see, again, whether there's a difference between your dominant hand, your right or your left, versus non-dominant, and see if there's a big discrepancy between right and left hand performance on measures of fine motor speed, um, fine motor coordination. This might be something like putting little pegs in holes, um, or your grip strength, which is simply how hard you can squeeze something that's called a dynamometer, which measures your grip strength. And we look at right versus left hand performance. And whereas in children we might do a more comprehensive evaluation of academic skills, for most adults, unless they're in college, and then again we might do a more comprehensive, a comprehensive evaluation, we might do, we'll do a screening of academic skills. So things like just basic word reading, spelling, arithmetic, and what we want to see here is whether the skills are commensurate with where we'd expect them to be, given a patient's intellectual functioning, given their intellectual, given their educational history. And then finally, the last part of the evaluation is an evaluation of emotional functioning and personality. And these are generally self-report inventories of affective distress. So as I mentioned earlier, we know that there is comorbidity with various um, psychological uh, disorders, such as depression and anxiety, um, in patients with epilepsy. So we certainly want to screen for these and make sure that they're treated appropriately. So we look at things like um, symptoms of depression, anxiety, anger, um, personality function, and also quality of life. So there are certain um, inventories that we use specifically to measure quality of life in epilepsy along different areas like emotional function, cognitive function, social function, medication effects. All of these things we know can have a significant impact on quality of life. And finally, coping strategies. We want to see how patients cope with stress, whether they use a more task-oriented approach or maybe a more emotionally-based approach. When we're testing, there are other considerations that we also take into account. So one of these is called symptom validity or effort testing. And we want to make sure that when we're giving these tests and when patients are responding, that they're putting forth full effort. So there are certain tests that we can use that assess effort. And if someone does not pass one of these effort tests, then it puts into question the validity of the test results. And there could be a number of reasons why a patient wouldn't put forth full effort. Um, if there's something like litigation at play, um, there are a number of reasons why someone might put forth suboptimal effort. And we want to make sure that that's not happening, because it really calls into question all of our test results. Um, other testing consideration is if we're testing patients with special needs. So how we would tailor the evaluation if we know that someone has a significant visual deficit or a hearing impairment. Um, testing of English as second language patients. Um, I spoke about this a little bit earlier, but we always want to try whenever possible to evaluate someone in their primary language, because otherwise, if test scores are a little bit low or, or significantly low, then we don't know whether it's because there's a language barrier or because there's an actual weakness in this area. Sometimes it's not possible to test someone in their primary language, and if we do have to test someone in their second language, then we want to really take that into consideration and, and look at all of the scores, not just in terms of their objective findings, but in terms subjectively as well. Um, another testing consideration, and this is obviously for the epilepsy population, is whether there a patient has, if a patient has a seizure during testing, then we obviously have to discontinue the testing for as long as it takes for the patient to return back to their baseline. And just to be really aware, sometimes um, seizures can be very subtle. And it could be something like a very quick 
sharing episodes and just making sure that aware of um, what type of seizures the patient has and, and, make, and if they do appear to have something like a very mild um, staring episode during testing, well, how will that factor into the test results and, and maybe taking the test results with a grain of salt because you know that they've had a seizure. So once the neuropsychological evaluation is done, the neuropsychologist takes all of the results and the results go into the report. And the report, the layout of the report, um, in my case and in most cases, is it starts out with the background and history. So the information that was taken from the patient during that initial clinical interview. So it would include medical history, psychiatric history, educational history, and also any available history from medical records. The next part of the report are the behavioral observations. And this is where the neuropsychologist would put anything that might have impacted the test results. So if they felt like the patient wasn't being cooperative, if the patient was very fatigued, um, if, uh, if the patient had a seizure during testing, if there are language um, problems that might have affected performance. So this is where you'd put anything or you'd find anything that could be a caveat in terms of the findings. Then we have the names of the tests that were administered, and they're usually not so meaningful to the patient, but they're really there so that if you're ever retested, we know exactly what test you got at the time of the evaluation. So if you want to retest, we can do that and know, and know exactly what test to administer in order to make a one-to-one -one comparison. The bulk of the report is the test results, and those are broken down into different areas of functioning, like the ones that we talked about earlier, intellectual functioning, attention, processing speed, executive functions, and that's where each of the various tests are described, and the scores are reported. And the scores are typically described in terms, qualitatively, in terms of average, low average, um, high average, superior. So the numbers are there as well as a qualitative description of what those numbers mean. Then at the end of the report, there's a summary of the findings. Um, so that's where you get a big picture of how you did. And, um, and that's usually the, kind of the most meaningful because it, it gives you the, the big picture and just the take home message the diagnostic impression, so what the neuropsychologist thinks is going on, what is contributing to the results of the evaluation, and then the recommendation. So we make recommendations based on the neuropsychological findings. And these can be sometimes in a report that's maybe 10 pages, you might have three pages of recommendations. And these can include things such as cognitive rehabilitation, um, if someone needs specific help in a certain area like memory or executive functions, they might point you in that direction. Um, we also provide memory and attentional strategies, different kinds of compensatory strategies that you can use in your day-to-day -day life that can help make functioning a bit easier. If we find, um, based on the test results, that there is um, significant depression or emotional distress, then we'll recommend that you seek um, psychiatric treatment or psychotherapy to address those symptoms and to assist in maybe developing better coping strategies. Um, for patients that need, um, that are looking for work or trying to figure out what would be um, an appropriate type of career or work for them, um, we can also put you in touch with a vocational counselor. Um, if something like speech or physical or occupational therapy seems to be in order, so we might make that recommendation. Um, for patients that are, are pre-surgical patients, then we recommend that after their surgery that they come back 6 to 12 months following surgery so that, again, we can determine whether there's been any changes in cognitive functioning and then we can also assess the need for something like rehabilitation following surgery. And then for patients that are in school or considering going back to school, we also have a whole host of academic accommodations that we can make, whether it be extended time on tests, um, being allowed to 
um, have access to a professor, professor's lectures. Um, and we recommend that if you are in school, that you would share the neuropsychological evaluation with the, um, the counseling office or the guidance office of the school so that they know exactly what kinds of accommodations we're recommending. So when you are referred for a neuropsychological evaluation, there are some things to keep in mind before the evaluation, before coming in. So one important thing is to get a good night's sleep the night before so you're well rested and fresh. We always want to get the best level of performance. So if you had a really rough night the night before, you didn't sleep well, or you haven't slept well for the past week because for whatever reason, you're not going to perform as well on these tests. And we really do want to get your best level of functioning. So make every attempt to get a good night's sleep the night before, have a good breakfast, or at least whatever you're used to um, so that you can perform optimally on the test. Um, making sure that you bring with you your glasses or a hearing aid because we wa don't want any kinds of sensory issues to impact performance. Um, one thing that we will ask about is um, medication. So having a list of medications with you can be very helpful. Also bring any medical records or previous neuropsychological evaluations so that we have that information or have the neuropsychological evaluations in order to um, assess any changes. And that way we can also repeat any tests that were previously given. And if you find it helpful, bringing a family member to also help provide the history. Um, sometimes it's hard to remember everything on your own, so if you bring a parent or, or, or um, a grown child with you to help provide some of the history, that can be particularly useful. So the important things to remember during the neurocycle of neuropsychological evaluation is that no one knows all the answers. Nobody gets every item correct. The tests are really designed to test the limits of what you know and what you're, what you're able to do. So you'll notice that some of the tests start off a little bit easier and get progressively harder. And again, that's to test the limits. And so for some people, it can be very frustrating, especially for very high-functioning individuals that are used to knowing all the answers and getting everything right. It's just not possible to do that on these kinds of tests. So it's important to remember that you're not going to know all the answers, and it's OK to say, I don't know. Um, all that we ask is that you try and do the best that you can and put forth the best effort that you can. During the testing session, the examiner really can't give too much feedback. So I can't tell you whether you got something right or wrong. Um, I can't tell you. I can't give you any answers, obviously. but if there's anything that's unclear, the examiner can certainly explain it in greater detail in terms of if there's instructions that you're not really sure what we're asking for. But you can also rest assured that all of the results will be provided in the report and also explained during the feedback session. So, so you will get the feedback. You will get the response, just not immediately as the test is going on. Each test in and of itself, and you saw that we test so many different aspects of cognitive functioning, each test is rather brief. So if there's a test that you're doing and you're finding it to be really frustrating or really annoying, you can rest assured that that test will be over pretty shortly and we'll move on to something else that is hopefully less frustrating or less annoying. Um, and the way that the tests are, some of them are a little bit more like puzzles or games. Some of them are more like um, uh, memorizing lists of words or, or listening to stories. So some of them you might find kind of fun. It's not unusual for me to, to, to speak with a patient afterwards, and they'll say, you know, that was kind of enjoyable. And, and especially getting the results back and getting a, a really good sense of the areas of strength, the areas of weakness, if any, it's just another way of understanding, another piece of the puzzle. And it's why your neurologist would recommend for you to have this kind of testing. Um, also during the evaluation, we want you to be as comfortable as possible because as I, as I said, we want to get your best level of performance. So um, your, the examiner will probably offer you breaks, but um, if they don't, then ask to have a break, use the restroom, stretch your legs, have a snack, because again, that's going to keep you the most fresh and make you have the best 
level of performance. So after the neuropsychological evaluation, um, we have a feedback session scheduled two to three weeks after the evaluation. And in that session, that's where we re review the results and the recommendations. Um, every patient receives a copy of the neuropsychological evaluation report. So you have it for your own record, and you can um, go through it and share it with your other physicians if you think that that would be helpful. And the report is also provided to your referring physician, so they also get the results of the evaluation. So I hope that this has clarified some of the questions that you might have had regarding what it means when your neurologist or your epileptologist refers you for a neuropsychological evaluation and hopefully takes some of the anxiety out of it because as I said, you're not expected to know all the answers. You're not expected to get everything right. Um, and it just gives you it's another piece of the puzzle. So just like you've had those EEGs or just like you've had an MRI, this test, as I said, helps you, helps us look at your brain by making you use it. So it's another piece of information that can be helpful in your treatment and, um, and your, your future with your epilepsy doctor. Thank you very much for your attendance. Have a good night.